How does a baby convert to Christianity become one of the world's prolific New Testament scholars? Stay tuned as we continue our conversation with Dr. Craig Keener on the Bible Backgrounds podcast. I'm Kurt Jiris, your host. <music> Greetings in the Lord. This is the Bible Backgrounds podcast with Dr. Craig Keener. Dr. Keener, on last week's episode, we heard about your upbringing and your conversion uh, story, your testimony on how you became a Christian. But really, I'm wondering, how do we go from a baby convert to Christianity to this? How do we get to the prolific scholar that we know uh, and that we read? And, uh, you know, you knew very little about Christianity. What you had known as a non-believer was the Trinity and gargoyles. And uh, you, you were talking to God and you learned more about the sinner's prayer. Take us away from there. You're 15 years old uh, or so. And uh, where does your journey continue? Yeah. Well, you're saying, how do you go from a baby Christian to um, a Christian my age? And there are a lot of decades in between. But I was bald when I was born and I'm still bald, <laughs> more or less. Actually, the little kids in Sunday school know more about the Bible than I did. So I did what I would have done in school. I started cramming. I tried to catch up. And eventually, I mean, I just got such a craving for it. I found out that if you read 40 chapters of the Bible a day, you can get through the New Testament every week, or you can read through the Bible every month. And there were a lot of discoveries awaiting me. Because of my background with, with Plato and Greek philosophy and, and Greek thought, there were some things in the New Testament that I understood well, and there were a lot of things in the New Testament I understood exactly wrong, but uh, because I didn't have the fuller background, I only had a, a slice of the background. Mm. But at least I, I understood it was, it reflected words from a different culture. But when I started, you know, even, even the different culture part I wasn't used to because people said, okay, the Bible is God's word. And so I assumed that that meant it was dictated first person from God. They told me to start with the New Testament, which is what I'd been doing anyway. So I, I, I read through Matthew and it, hey, that was good. And then I read through Mark and I'm like, wait a minute, this is the second time he's getting crucified. How often <laughs> is this gonna happen? I really didn't know, you know, and then in terms of learning, learning how to read in context and so on, you know, I was more of a math science person. I read, I read, you know, ancient history and ancient literature and so on, but more in terms of math science. So I take a verse here and a verse there, and I'd be thinking in terms of the transitive property of equality, you know, and reading this verse into that one, instead of, you know, reading the whole flow of context mm. sometimes. And that got me in some trouble early on. Because you were like predicting the day Jesus would return. And, no, you know, not, not that bad. Yeah, and gematria with the numbers. And <laughs> no, 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 not, not that. But yeah, I, I had so much to learn. Mm. And, and, you know, my, my friends were patient with me. <sighs> Literally, because you're reading 40 chapters a day, so they had to wait, you know, for you to... <laughs> Finish. I mean, that's a lot of reading that you were you were doing. Some people don't even read forty chapters of the Bible in a year, so you know. Yeah. You were really picking up the steam there. Yeah, actually, I knew I'd filled my mind with other things, and so I really wanted to fill my mind and heart with what mattered forever, with what God had to say. So, I quit watching television, gave it up. Oh, that was hard. Okay. <laughs> uh, and yeah, I mean, not everything on television was bad, but it was like, oh, now I have something so much more important. And also I was addicted, so I had to give it up. I was addicted to comic books. Mm. Uh, you know, so y you hear me reading Plato, but on the other hand, I'm still like 15 years old. So, <laughs> uh, and I guess today it wouldn't be so much comic books as, you know, mo you know movies, movies or whatever. Movies, yeah, DVDs, but, yeah. But I, you know, I, I, I had to break my addiction to all those things, that way of thinking, so I just tried to do it cold turkey and then uh, just focus on, on God's Word mm. and learning God's Word. So you graduate high school, okay, where did you go from there? Did you go off to college right away? 
Yeah. Um, actually, I, I have a National Merit Scholarship to be able to, to go on. Do they still have those? I don't know. I think so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and they asked me, you know, where I wanted to use it for. And one option was Malone College. It was a, an evangelical school not too far from, from where I lived. A good, good Christian school, w worthy of consideration. But I really felt like God wanted me to go to the Bible College where my pastor had gone. Uh, in, the, in the church I was part of, the pastor was now mentoring me. And National Merit Scholarship said, no, that's not one of the options. Mm. Uh, you can't go to that Bible college because it's not accredited. Well, it was regionally accredited, but it wasn't accredited with their accreditation. So I turned down the National Merit Scholarship mm. and my family was upset. <laughs> Free money! <laughs> Even, well, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. College back then didn't cost nearly what it costs today. Yeah. I mean, it was like, I think tuition was like $1,500 a year or something yeah, for the Bible e college. Even after inflation, it's still not I mean, yeah. what it is today. Yeah, yeah. but they didn't, they didn't pay the, pa the teachers very well either. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, and the guy, the guy, the cafeteria manager, he managed to uh, uh, get food it was kind of old, but it wasn't like past, you know, what you could use. And so he got it cheap. So 33 cents per meal per person. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway. So what was the name of the school? It was Central Bible College. It's okay. now been absorbed into Evangel University. Yeah. So I guess I would get the scholarship now. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but so uh, when it was absorbed uh, or, or prior to that, is this in Missouri? Or? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Springfield, Missouri. Okay. And so... Uh, yeah, even my pastor tried to talk me out of it because, you know, it was like, why, you know, you have this opportunity. And I mean, the first place that wrote to me was West Point. My dad was a veteran and he was like, what's wrong with you <laughs> just ignoring this? And then Harvard and all these places, they send you, send you stuff. But I, I felt like God wanted me to go there. Mm. And it was good because I'd been on the defensive, you know, for a while, um, you know, witnessing to people, sharing my faith, because that's where, I mean, I heard, I heard the gospel because people went out of their comfort zone and shared it with me. Mm. So I was doing that. I was sharing Christ with people on the street. And I experienced a lot of hostility, including being beaten and yeah. um, having my life threatened and, and so on. So it was nice to spend a little bit of time in the Bible Belt, <laughs> um, although it was total culture shock to me, you know, sharing Christ with somebody and they said, yeah, I know I'm going to hell. I don't care. I'm like, I never heard that before. <laughs> and then I, would, then I would meet Baptists, you know, Baptists witnessed to me. They were the ones who brought me the gospel. I'd meet nominal Baptists, mm. you know, <laughs> who, who thought they were saved because they got baptized years ago or something like that. They've got the stay out of hell free card. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so... <laughs> Yeah, it, it was it was culture shock, but it it was at least people weren't making fun of me so much for my faith. And in Bible college, obviously not. Mm. You know, there if you wanted, I mean, there we argued about the least little. I mean, uh, <laughs> the things I argued with my friends about, uh, we were so into picky little doctrinal differences. And it's not that doctrinal differences don't matter, but it's like. Um, <laughs> after getting back out in the real world. You know, by the time I went to seminary, I was like desperate. Teach me something, please help me. <laughs> but Bible college, you know, we were we all thought we were smart. And, mm. um, so, but as I'm reading the Bible there, and uh, it's not like I was doing 40 chapters a, a day every week, but um, but for an, I think I did it like seven weeks in a row, and then some other times I did it, and then. Um, sometimes I was doing other things, you know, immersing myself in scripture. But when I was there, it was increasingly growing on me that I really needed Bible background. Is that what this podcast is named? <laughs> what a coincidence! <laughs> but, I mean, like the women wearing head coverings. None of the women were wearing head coverings. Mm -hmm. And the greeting one another with a holy kiss. Yeah, we're not doing that. I... I <laughs> And back then they didn't brush their teeth. So I, I was like, 
you know, I know the Bible says to do this. I want to obey everything in the Bible. But I hadn't worked up enough nerve to actually go up to people and do it to them. Um, and it w I would have been even more scared if I'd understood that in the first century, these were kisses on the lips, mm. uh, light kisses on the lips, but uh, offended my, would have offended my sense of hygiene and sanitation. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, and, then, and then about parents arranging marriages. I mean, that wasn't prescribed in the Bible, but that seemed to be the pattern. And I was like, I don't think I want to tell my parents about this. Uh, they wouldn't have done it anyway, but I was, uh, I, I didn't know what to do with those things. Mm. And then there were other things where I just, uh, you know, like instinctively it didn't seem to be the spirit of the gospel, but this was what it said in this particular text. Some tricky passages. Some tricky passages. But the big thing that got me, you know, was one day when I was doing my, you know, reading through the through the New Testament in one week, and I I did Matthew and Mark on, I guess I did Matthew and Mark on Sunday, uh, would have done John, uh, Luke and John on Monday, and so I I was doing uh, Acts and Romans the next day, and then the rest of the week was pretty light in terms of uh, how much to read. I was also working. Uh, 12 hours a week on maintenance, the maintenance crew to earn money because <laughs> I didn't have a scholarship. <laughs> and, and, uh, and then I was taking a bunch of classes, including Greek and Hebrew, my first year. So I was really busy. But I was reading Romans and I got up to verse 7 and I'm like, okay, Paul says this is written to the church in Rome, or well, the saints in Rome, the consecrated ones in Rome. And I'm like, wait a minute. I've been trying to read this like, okay, here, here are Bible memory verses. There's a lot of blank space in between. Well, after, after a couple weeks of you know, reading straight through, I'm picking up on context. I'm reading the whole thing straight, straight through and yeah. not isolated verses now. But there were still verses I wasn't taking as seriously as other verses. And I'm at this verse, and it's like, this is actually a letter to the church in Rome. And so if I really want to understand what Paul was saying, I have to put myself in the shoes of the people in Rome. And that means I need to understand their setting. Now, it doesn't mean that, you know, the verses I was reading before weren't important. I mean, I, I, I was at least connecting a lot of them with their context by this point. Uh, but. So that changed the way I read 90% of scripture, <laughs> reading in context. But I began to realize a lot of the questions that I still have could be resolved better if I understood the things that, say, Paul didn't have to tell the believers in Rome because they already knew certain things. Mm -hmm. I mean, he knew Greek, they knew Greek. He didn't have to translate the Greek for them into some other language. Yeah. Uh, we, we get the translations. He also could assume things about their setting without explaining them. And, and I mean, we, we do this. I mean, I, I could, I could uh, tell a joke about something and you might get it because we're from the same culture. But my wife, who's from Congo Brazzaville, um, like my old Star Trek illusions, she wouldn't get them. <laughs> Uh, we we found some things where we did have common background, and so, but there were other things I'd have to stop and explain. Mm. M Mark stops and explains a Jewish custom in Mark chapter seven. Matthew fifteen, dealing with the same passage, doesn't explain the custom because his audience already knew Jewish customs. So I realized, okay, I need to start learning background, and. I I didn't even realize that some of my background in, in Greek sources was going to help me later on. Yeah. Or, or reading, you know, Roman historians like Tacitus. I did that before I was a Christian. I didn't realize how that was going to help me with with uh, New Testament background yet. But I realized I needed the Jewish context. That It was that with which I was most unfamiliar. And so I got a book on ancient Judaism by George Footmore. 
uh, written around 1927, I guess. It was an old book. Uh, I had the repackaged 1971 edition, I think, from Schocken Books, a Jewish publisher. So I read through that and I said, oh, now I understand ancient Judaism. And then I read another book on ancient Judaism by Samuel Sandmill. And then I was confused. Because <laughs> They didn't agree on everything. Right. And it was like, oh, how am I going to do this? And so my one professor who was really most knowledgeable about this was Benny Aker. And I asked, I asked him about it. You know, what, what can I do? I mean, they agree on 80% of the stuff, but like 20% of the stuff, they disagree. What can I do? He's, he said, well, just keep studying and you'll, and you'll learn. No, I wanted him to tell me what to do. But so I read more. And eventually I started reading the primary sources. Mm. Well, in, in English translation. Eventually, you know, I went beyond the English translation, but that's where I started. So that's what got me into the Bible background. Mm. And my plan was just to go to this Bible college for two years. It was a four-year program, but I was going to go for two years and then go out and preach because the only instructions I felt that I had from the Lord was, you know, go for two years. But by the end of the two years, I'm praying about what I should do now. I, I, I felt like the Lord directed me to the example of Ben Aker. You know, I was called to teach, teach the Bible, and the way I felt God called me to do it was I felt he called me to call the church back to the Word, back to the Scriptures. And I had no idea what he meant by that. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people have the same calling. And sometimes when we first get the calling, we don't know what that means. But when I... Um, when I was praying about it, I, I felt like, okay, this is a way I can impact more people than just going from one church to another and preaching. I can become a, a teacher like Ben Aker, and I can teach students who will be pastors, and that, that proliferates it and multiplies it. But most of the teachers don't have most of this Bible background to give it to us. So I need to, I need to get it so I can make it available. And it was actually, this is skipping way ahead, um, but you know, I started keeping notes and index cards. Back then, you couldn't you know, keep a whole bunch of information on a flash drive or on you know, other electronic resources. So I had I had like, by the time I started my doctorate, I had about 30,000 index cards. I had about 70,000 by the time I finished, and then about 100,000 by the time I was ready to, you know, start, I, I could put things in computer. <clears throat> but at that point, I was, um, I was thinking, okay, well, if by the time I finish my doctorate, nobody has, has made this available, I'm going to do a Bible background commentary and make it just put it at people's fingertips because I just wanted to go out and preach, you know? And, and, and there were a lot of people who just wanted to go out and preach and this would put it at people's fingertips. Like in the tradition I was in, not everybody had seminary. And, you know, even in Bible college, I mean, not all the professors even knew, knew enough about the background. So I wanted to, to put it at people's fingertips, put it in one volume and yeah. So that's how you got started. Uh, yeah. From a baby convert to Christianity, you were reading the Bible 40 chapters a day for seven weeks to catch up. Well, on. it wasn't just seven weeks, but it was seven weeks in a row and then other, other weeks here and there. Sure. Yeah. But you really spent a lot of time catching up. Yeah. So your, your lifestyle habits of reading and consuming information, that didn't really change. And that wasn't a shift for you. Although you did do away with the addiction to TV. Well, also, I'm ADHD, so I have trouble concentrating. So the proof text method was kind of easier You have trouble concentrating. For me. Yes, in, unless I really <laughs> get hyper-focused. So yeah. uh, that, that's actually been a painful discipline, making myself sit there, mm. finish a project, like the, like the Acts commentary that took me about 10 years to write. Mm. Um, but it's 4,500 pages, so it, yeah. I mean, it wasn't like it it's was... It's a beast. Yeah. Um, but it was hard. It was painful. And 
Actually, at the time I was done, I thought I had so much brain damage, I thought I'd never recover. It took me a couple of years to recover from that one. But, um, but early on, you know, when I would just quote scripture and, you know, I, I had all the Bible memory verses, which were good for, you know, doing what the people who witnessed to me did <laughs> when I would witness to people. Um, but the Lord had to teach me. But early on, there was one time when I was, uh, I was doing a special, um, it was third year Latin, and it wasn't really offered by the school, so the teacher was giving me private tutoring in it. So I would come over to his house, and uh, my homework was supposed to be translating Caesar's Gallic War. And, you know, now that I was a Christian, I really didn't care about Caesar. I wanted to learn about Jesus. And so, as I'm walking home, and I'm, you know, I know I'm supposed to get home and translate Caesar, I'm like, God, all I want to do is read the Bible. And so I flipped open my Bible and stuck my finger down, hoping it would say, forsake all and follow me. Instead, it said, render to Caesar. What is Caesar's? <laughs> so I did my Latin, you know. Yeah. But imagine me going around to all the churches today and, and saying, this is what God told me is the meaning of this verse. You should translate Caesar. No, I mean, it was good for me. I needed to you know, study my Latin and so mm -hmm. on because of the scholarship God had for me way in the future. But that's not the meaning of that verse. Mm -hmm. You know, God can speak to you through a verse out of context the way he can speak through a, a tree or a poem or sermon illustration or whatever, but, or a donkey. But <laughs> that's not the universal meaning of that verse. And yeah. so, um, you know, going back, reading scripture in context, and then reading it the way God gave it to us. You know, <laughs> he gave it to us a book at a time. He gave it to us, well, usually, I mean, there are exceptions like Proverbs is an assortment and so on, but like the Gospel of Mark, you know, it was given to people a book, at a, you know, as the Gospel of Mark. And so reading it straight through and seeing how any, any one passage in that book refracts the themes that run through that book, how it, how it fits into the larger story or the larger arguments, say, in Romans, um, you know, each, each book on its own terms. And then, you know, God gave it in a certain language, in a certain culture. So I want to research that and then make it available to people in, in terms as relevant mm. and as intelligible as, as I can make make them good let's leave the story there we'll we'll pick it up next week and uh, look forward to even hearing more about your wonderful journey the people you met along the way and uh, there's so much more for us for us to discuss if you'd like to uh, learn more about dr. Keener's journey or visit the treasure trove of resources head on over to craigkeener.com it's there you can find all these great resources his blog posts and even his cartoons, which are some fun, humorous, punny little bits that he puts out weekly, right? I think every week, weekend, you, you sketch up something for us to see. Actually, I don't do it every weekend. It's just sometimes when my brain is so burned out mm. or when I'm on my Sabbath, on, on Shabbat, I will... Um, <clears throat> and, 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 I, and I don't have anything else scheduled, I will... Uh, well, I say I save up the ideas. I, I, I write down the ideas, mm -hmm. and then and then I draw them, uh, a bunch of them over the course of a few hours. Yeah. So, but they're they're scheduled every week. That's right. Great, wonderful. That's a, a sort of artistic talent, little known ar artistic talent that you have. And so, uh, for those of you that subscribe to his website, you'll get those updates. And be sure to subscribe to this podcast on YouTube if you're following Dr. Keener's YouTube channel or whatever app you may be listening. Uh, for podcasts, whether that's the iTunes, uh, Apple Podcast app, or the Google Play Store, whatever app you may be using. We look forward to seeing you next week.